we're at Vox Day Stuccino. I'm here with Manuel and Claudio, and you're from lastminute.com and you're giving a talk this afternoon. Can you tell me a bit about your talk? Absolutely. So the talk is basically our journey through uh, one year to basically get to an on-premises cluster for uh, Kubernetes. Quite a big challenge because we were coming from a uh, huge of technical depths in terms of infrastructure and platform, but we wanted to push forward being bleeding edge and basically moving from virtual machines and the difficulties and challenges of managing them for one hundred of microservices and basically getting to the bleeding edge, which was containers, Docker, Kubernetes, and basically get all the benefits of it. What do you think the benefits of using containers are over virtual machines? Okay, uh, benefits are in first instance that uh, containers are more flexible. Um, a container is an in, in terms of development uh, uh, process is an immutable thing that can move through uh, environments. Then we can have the same environment, the the, the, the same behavior between environments that uh, the developers can uh, build uh, a software and then move this software with all the things that uh, run outside the software in a different environment like uh, staging or QA or production with the uh, exactly the same behavior then there is no difference um, the also the the patch management the security management is quite simple because every deploy can ship all the upgrades if there is a, a pipeline that can support this um, also the the, scala the scalability of the uh, the pods are very fast. It's only a matter of uh, a number in a YAML file or in a, in a command line. We can uh, scale um, a pod, that means a service, from 10 to 100 in a, in a shot. Yeah, I think uh, from a software engineering perspective, a software development workflow is also trying to raise the confidence of our development teams. Essentially, you're shipping uh, an immutable image of what your software is doing across different environments really fast. So I think it's also a matter of decoupling what is the externalized configuration that changed between the different environments and being able basically to have the confidence of having the same piece of software that is going through dev, QA, until production. So essentially, it's trying to push faster, more reliably, and more frequently which was something we couldn't do in the past because when we were using the virtual machines, basically uh, less standard, less guidelines, heterogeneous environment, and that basically say, means that every single, let's say, product or software engineering uh, application was essentially different uh, one from another. Yeah. So diminishing returns in terms of producing waste, uh, less confidence when deploying while mm -hmm single technology, immutable images, and we know what, what is the infrastructure we're going to deploy into because it's basically homogeneous between all the environments we have. And did you find that you had kind of any unexpected advantages as well after you'd made the change? <laughs> as well as being bleeding edge, did you get a performance Bleeding edge? Or? Yes, I think so, because essentially what we experienced uh, is that we were looking forward to it, but uh, we didn't think it could work so well. But uh, mixing Kubernetes with Docker images, basically the end result was that the architecture was so stable that I think it's almost nine months, 10, uh, 10 months now that we didn't touch anything on our infrastructure. And that's okay. why the property of self-healing is clearly there. So we had a number of incidents from a hardware perspective, but nobody, nobody from the business part noticed because the actual migration of the pods, the actual migration of all of our services happen behind the scene. And that's, I think, is way more than we expected. Now, I think also that using bleeding edge technologies is pushing everybody from a culture and mentality perspective towards new results because it, it opens up new opportunity and you want to take them. So you start considering things you've never done in the past just because the opportunity and the features are there. Oh, okay. You just need to grab them and take them. So you almost had a cultural shift then in your development teams with people thinking, oh, now we're sharing containers. Why don't we try this or this? 
Exactly. I think that applies also for the SREs. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Kubernetes and Docker are able, really able to decouple the service that uh, are provided through their hardware. Then we ha have the freedom to change hardware, to change operating system, uh, maintain the same uh, behavior. Then uh, the services are not touched. Um, we, we encounter some problems with other operating system, then we change the operating system and nothing happens on Kubernetes side, nothing happens on the deployment side, uh, no disruption service or other things. And uh, it's a kind of magic, really. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. I think another unexpected benefit is probably shielding our engineering team from what is happening behind the scene. Yep. It's completely transparent. They continue their work stream. They deliver business value, product online, while under the wood we are working in terms of mixing things, trying new things, trying to implement new features behind the scene, and they basically get delivered uh, almost seamlessly. Okay. So they get to use it without knowing, most likely. And what's the most interesting thing you learned? It's a difficult, <laughs> really hard path. <laughs> so uh, when we started, we never thought that we could have so many unexpected issues. So the journey has not been so smooth, probably because we were leading edge from one perspective, probably because when you start scaling in production, uh, what you see that you have to start patching Kubernetes or working around any glitches you might have, it's not easy. No, it's not really easy. There are a lot of uh, unexpected behavior. Uh, there are um, things that are very different. A pod is not a virtual machine. A pod is a slice in an operating system. Uh, the pod speaking directly to the kernel. Then uh, um, there, there are um, behaviors that are strange for a person that comes from the, the classic virtual machine behavior or classic server behavior. Um, things like uh, we, we use Nginx as a Ingress uh, and uh, Jinx is uh, like a, a, web, mm, a serverless proxy with superpower. Um, and we, we encountered some bugs in this uh, software that create problems that uh, is uh, absolutely unexpected. And we, we solved this, of course. And we worked to solve this and we solved this. I, oh, oh my gosh, what, what happened? Uh, we tried the test and uh, all goes down. It was the, the first time. First. Uh, it's uh, really unexpected. Now we are uh, learning uh, the, this behavior. We are learning how to understand uh, the, the problems um, after or before. It depends. But uh, normally, it's, uh, we are learning a lot of things. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> So to summarize properly, it's something oh. you uh, you have to understand that you're going to face it. Yeah. <laughs> Moreover, if you are, have a lot of constraints, like we did, so not being able to embrace immediately the public clouds, mm. that is a problem because we had a, a huge data center. Uh, we cannot basically decide from one moment to the other to basically disinvest completely, and the cost was really high. So. To create even an hybrid cloud, you need to start with an on-premises uh, okay. cluster. And that has a lot of constraints in terms of how you do things and even how you tackle technical debt uh, as you cannot essentially block the roadmap of the product or the business. Because yeah. weird enough, business uh, doesn't like it. So cool. that was tough. Thank you very, very much.